Добър ден. А, аз съм Илияна Николова, от изпълнителен директор на Фундация Работилница за граждански инициативи. А, организацията, която има честа за втора пореден период, програмен период, да бъде част от консорциума, който управлява програмата за подкрепа на неправителствените организации, която сега се нарича Фонд Активни граждани. А, панелът, който започваме, е а, важен от гледна точка на а, гражданските организации и а, предизвикателствата или възможностите, които те срещат, работейки в един определен контекст. И така, както Георги Стойчев каза, наистина контекстът е изключително важен. А, ние в рамките на 60 минути ще се опитаме да ви представим наистина контекста, в който гражданските организации а, работят, а, какво те могат или какво би трябвало да променят, какви са нагласите на а, обществото към демокрацията, гражданските, а, гражданското участие, правата на гражданите. А, както а, всички а, прежде говорищи казаха, демокрацията е изключително важна. Тя е част от европейските ценности. И а, аз, а, това е, може би, третото изследване, на което присъствам, което прави Институт Отворено общество за нагласите на, към демокрацията, правата на човека и върховенството на правото, в която а, всички единодушно резултати сочат, че българските граждани смятат демокрацията за изключително важна и най-добрата форма на управление, така каквато съществува. Но сега ще чуем повече. За започваме с европейските ценности. Бих искала да ви представя господин Робърт Ян У, който е от Агенцията на Европейския съюз за основните права. Той ще представи предизвикателствата, на които стоят пред гражданските организации, които работят в областта на а, човешките права. It's important to place the, the issue we're going to discuss today in a bit of context, uh, <clears throat> in this case the, the European uh, context. So I'm from the EU uh, Agency for Fundamental Rights. Um, we uh, are a Vienna-based uh, uh, body of the uh, European Union, which um, does uh, research and, and human rights uh, promotion throughout the European Union. Um, and recently we uh, uh, wrote a report uh, detailing the uh, situation of civil society in the European Union. Um, this report uh, covers uh, a number of different areas, um, and we, uh, you, you, I think some of you have even uh, already taken some copies of it. Um, <coughs> in essence, uh, the report, oh yeah, there it is, I can have the, uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so as, as, as an EU body, uh, we are, of course, based on, on a founding uh, regulation. Um, the uh, founding regulation uh, requires us to work very closely with uh, non-governmental organizations and civil society organizations. Um, and as I said, we, we, we drafted a, a report uh, on civil society space, uh, uh, basically looking at the last uh, five years, or now uh, a couple of years ago already, 2011-2016. Um, we consulted widely with uh, civil society organizations, uh, including uh, funders and foundations and many other types of, of organizations, and we launched this report in Brussels in January. Um, in a nutshell, the report looks at four uh, areas of concern um, of, uh, you know, uh, in relation to civil society in the European Union. Uh, first of all, uh, it, it talks about the uh, regulatory environment. So the freedoms of assembly, association, expression, um, and, and other uh, fundamental rights uh, and restrictions uh, imposed in, in those areas on civil society organizations. The second issue is access to resources, something, of course, very relevant to our discussion uh, today. Um, so the, the idea of uh, ensuring that NGOs have sufficient resources to do human rights work and the obstacles to that. Um, 
The third area is participation. Um, so the, the, the idea as is also being mentioned here of active participation uh, and ensuring that, that human rights uh, uh, NGOs uh, can participate actively in the processes of lawmaking um, and policy setting. Uh, so this is a very important uh, aspect as well. And then the final issue we discussed was safe space, safe environment uh, for, for uh, CSOs or civil society organizations. Of course, uh, they cannot operate uh, in a climate where they are under attack from third parties or even from the government in some cases. Uh, so it's important to, to highlight that topic as well. Um, these points broadly overlap by, with, with the definition that the United Nations uh, has, has uh, issued on civil society space. Um, of course, it's important in all these areas to take a gender perspective uh, and, and to also see it in, the li in, in line with the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. Of course, you cannot achieve the Sustainable Development Goals without civil society. So. Um, of course, we know that in, in external relations, in the, in the way that uh, the, the EU expresses itself towards the outside world, uh, there's been a great emphasis on uh, supporting uh, civil society. Uh, there's a lot of uh, funding, a lot of engagement. Uh, the EU regularly speaks out on behalf of civil society. Uh, but of course, it's also important for the EU um, to do that uh, within uh, the Union itself. Um, just a note on terminology, uh, the, the, the idea uh, of the report was to discuss civil society space, which is defined by the UN uh, Human Rights Office as uh, a, a place, the place where civil society, uh, the place civil society actors occupy within society, the, the environment and framework in which they operate, and the relationships amongst uh, civil society, the state and the public. Um, we uh, uh, define civil society organizations in line with our founding regulations, so non-governmental organizations active in the field of human, yeah, human rights, fundamental rights. And uh, uh, we also took note of the Council of Europe's uh, uh, recommendation uh, uh, to say that uh, they, are, they are voluntary uh, and self-governing bodies, so, uh, and of course they are essentially non-profit organizations. Uh, so those are the, that's sort of the definition we took as the starting point of the report. Um, so when it comes to uh, an enabling regulatory environment, um, of course, as I, as I mentioned, it's important to create a proper uh, regulatory environment for civil society organizations uh, to, to give them the, the freedom uh, to, to operate. Um, there is here both a negative obligation, so not to er interfere excessively with, uh, for example, the freedom of assembly or the freedom of association or the freedom of expression but also a positive obligation to uh, create such an enabling uh, environment. Um, we found a number of different challenges that are faced by uh, civil society organizations throughout the European Union. Um, first of all, uh, when it comes to freedom of association, it can sometimes still be a bit difficult to register um, uh, NGOs. Uh, this is administratively sometimes a bit difficult. Uh, obstacles are put in place to do that, although in, in most states it's, it's relatively easy, of course, uh, this is not a universal phenomenon. Um, also, uh, we found that, that in some cases there are not sufficient safeguards when it comes to prohibition or dissolution of NGOs, so especially in the area of counterterrorism, for example, um, there, there is a tendency uh, to place some excessive restrictions or to make it a little bit too easy um, to prohibit or dissolve NGOs. Uh, this, of course, should only be done uh, after intervention by courts in a fair uh, procedure. Um, another issue that we found in some areas were uh, entry restrictions. So, so some EU member states have imposed entry restrictions on, on people who want to do human rights work within the uh, European Union. Um, and of course, it's important there that states, when they do impose entry restrictions, um, do so on a, on a proper basis and explain why they're doing it and give a fair process for people who do want to enter the Union to do human rights work uh, here. Um, the second issue, uh, the second area is, is freedom of opinion and, and expression. Um, here we found a number of different uh, challenges. Um, one is in uh, transparency laws, uh, lobbying or election uh, related uh, regulations. Um, there is a, a tendency uh, to want to regulate correctly uh, the, uh, 
uh, funding of, of political parties. Of course, uh, there are many uh, countries uh, you know, which have various forms of regulation of uh, political party funding, financing, but we, we find that in some cases, um, uh, human rights work, human rights NGOs are uh, uh, sort of brought under the umbrella of political activity, so that human, human rights work is seen as political activity and thus falls in the framework of you know, lobbying laws, uh, electoral uh, laws, so, so laws that, that would limit foreign funding or that would limit funding in general. Uh, for example, many uh, electoral laws would, of course, limit the amount of funding an individual can give to an organization, and as soon as you're labeled as a political organization, uh, you're covered by election laws and so on. So this is a, a problem in some countries, uh, and, you know, and we think it is important to make sure that the definitions in these kinds of laws, uh, which are, of course, important, um, are not um, overly, uh, the, the restrictions are not overly broad so that they would cover the work of human rights uh, NGOs. Another issue is defamation legislation. Uh, of course, many, uh, the, the, the report details a number of states in the European Union that, uh, that have various forms of criminalization of insult to the state or insult to uh, the government or to heads of state and so on, or insult to foreign uh, states or, or, or heads of state. Um, so there, there's various forms of criminalization there. Um, and we think, although uh, you know, there, there may be some legitimate purposes in some cases to that, um, of course, it, it, there has been a call to decriminalize those, uh, those kinds of uh, uh, acts. Uh, and it is particularly important for human rights NGOs to be able to criticize the state, to be able to criticize the government, and not fear uh, criminal prosecution. So those, those laws are, are not helpful to, to a, a sort of uh, proper regulatory environment either. Uh, then in the area of freedom of peaceful assembly, we have uh, identified a number of challenges as well. So there are some states that still do impose content restrictions uh, on, on public protests, on public assemblies. Uh, so uh, here, uh, you know, you do see uh, a difference of treatment uh, of some assemblies versus others. We've also noted that some states still impose uh, blanket restrictions uh, of various kinds, so no demonstrations in certain places or certain times and so on, uh, or, or that they overly apply bans on, uh, on certain assemblies that uh, they do not let, allow assemblies to take place properly. Um, one area which I think there has been generally an improvement is probably policing of assemblies, but there are still problems there as well. Uh, states are, of course, under a duty to protect uh, uh, assemblies from third parties that seek to disrupt them. Uh, that is an area where, for example, in the area of pride parades, that there, there has been an improvement in some states, but there are still challenges in others where the police do not uh, give sufficient protection to assemblies. Um, another uh, area that in some states has been a topic of concern is that some assemblies are given priority over others. For example, uh, uh, assemblies that take place in a, on a cyclical, regular basis are prioritized over uh, assemblies that take place only once. I've mentioned already the lobbying regulations and advocacy uh, restrictions in, in that area, so restrictions on uh, sort of in the sense that, that NGOs are labeled as uh, lobbying organizations. Uh, uh, of course, there it's important not to overly apply those, those kinds of rules. Uh, and of course, the general trend as well is, is the area of counterterrorism and the related emergency laws that are passed. So for example, in the area of freedom of peaceful assembly, uh, requiring uh, permissions to assemble rather than notifying uh, those assemblies or even saying that assemblies cannot take place uh, because you know, it's too dangerous or putting them in uh, anti-terrorism laws and, and then putting very broad uh, restrictions in. So th that's another uh, area of concern. Um, so we've called for increased attention when, when drafting and implementing reg legislation where civil society I is affected. So this can be direct or indirect. It can be intentional or unintentional. So sometimes, for example, in the area of uh, election laws, there are very, uh, you know, very uh, uh, legitimate goals that are being pursued by states when they impose restrictions. Uh, but they can inadvertently restrict civil society as well. Um, so we've also c called for these lobbying and transparency laws to um, comply with international law and, and not hinder human rights advocacy. 
Uh, then when it comes to finance and, and funding, um, so uh, we note that, in, uh, that the legal frameworks and policies on, on the resources uh, uh, that NGOs have have a, a significant impact on freedom of association. There's not much data on this uh, across the European Union. It's hard to compare. Um, but uh, there has been some action, some calls for action recently. The, the idea of a European values instrument is, is really gaining traction now at the European level. So this is an, an instrument that would promote the European values like human rights, democracy, and the rule of law. So the EU itself uh, providing uh, funding next to, of course, the funding that uh, or organizations like EEA and Norway grants um, uh, already provide. Here, a, a number of challenges can also be identified. Um, so, uh, simply speaking, the, the amounts of funding are, are too low in some states. Uh, there's an overemphasis on project funding versus core funding, so there's insufficient uh, long-term funding. I think that was some, something that was mentioned just now in the, these speeches as well, how important that is, uh, and, uh, and the importance, of course, of multi-annual funding versus short-term funding. Uh, we also noted that a number of the procedures, uh, both at the EU level and at the national level, can be a little bit cumbersome to follow. It's very difficult to obtain funding. It's, it's, it's overly burdensome. Uh, uh, and it takes a lot of work and a lot of expertise to obtain funding. And that can be a hindrance, of course, as well, especially to smaller uh, NGOs. Um, another issue, of course, is the requirement of co-financing, the requirement to uh, report, uh, etc. And, and it can sometimes take really a long time to obtain funding or, or the final funding so that NGOs get into cash flow problems. Um, so it's important to make sure that uh, that's dealt with as well. Of course, there's also some side effects, again, of, of anti-terrorism uh, laws, uh, money laundering rules, and so on. Uh, and, and, for, and of course, the, the, the challenge of, in some states, um, the, the idea of uh, wanting to uh, restrict foreign funding. Um, we notice also some promising practices in some states like Estonia, Slovenia, uh, there, there is tracking of government funding, so there's proper data collection on that issue. And some states also provide funds for promotion uh, advocacy activities. So in other words, uh, it's important, of course, to, to have not only funds for uh, uh, service provision, but also for, for advocacy. I think this is something the Deputy Minister also noted in his uh, speech. Um, also, the issue of uh, uh, making sure that volunteering actually counts as co-financing is being uh, contemplated by, by the union itself. And we also uh, noted a number of countries that have uh, lottery revenues go to uh, civil society organizations. So here, again, it's, it's important to make sure that funding is available, that it covers not just service provision, but also watchdog activities. Uh, and that funding can flow f essentially freely throughout the European Union for CSOs. Uh, and of course that uh, reporting requirements, audits and so on should be uh, proportionate, that they should not be uh, excessive. The third issue is uh, the right to participation. So here it's imp uh, we, we, we discussed the importance of, of the need for CSOs to have input into law and, and policy proposals. Uh, as, a, as a way to improve legislation, as a way to improve participation and legitimacy of decision making. Um, uh, there is theoretical agreement that this is a good idea. Um, I think this is uh, certainly the case. Uh, there are many documents and many policies in this area. However, there is a, a lack of practical implementation, essentially. Uh, it is simply not being done. Uh, uh, NGOs are not, being, uh, sufficient, are not sufficiently being involved in law and policy making. So there's a number of challenges here as well. Uh, there's a, uh, there are uh, limits to, to access to information on the policy and the legislative process. Uh, uh, the rules are not clear. Uh, and if they are there, they're, they're applied fairly inconsistently. People have uh, also noticed uh, that there is a lack of skills, both on the side of government officials that are supposed to run uh, uh, you know, participation and, and, and involvement of civil society, but also on the part of uh, civil society it's itself sometimes. So it's important to do a capacity building there as well. Um, a key issue that, uh, that we've often seen is uh, giving very short time frames uh, for feedback for, uh, you know, although a law may be put up on, on you know, on, on, on the parliamentary website for comment, it, the period can sometimes be very short. We, we have some details, some examples of it being, you know, 24 hours or a few days, uh, sometimes even hours. So that's obviously not good enough. There, there needs to be uh, the proper time for people to react. And of course, in the report, we also note some specific challenges related to people with disabilities, 
um, there is um, often a lack of uh, information made available so that they can also participate. Although, as, as you see here, uh, and you will see in the report, there are also some promising practices on that where uh, people with disabilities are involved in the decision-making process, especially, of course, as a result of the UN Convention on the Rights of People with uh, Disabilities. Um, so we, we also noted some promising practices. Um, some countries have one-stop shops for information on public consultations, where all public consultations are uh, made available in one place, so it becomes very clear where you need to go if you want to comment on a, on a draft uh, policy or law. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned, the, the, the idea of training for public officials on how to do this uh, in some countries does, does take place. And there are also some good websites out there on how to, how to engage in it. Uh, here we think it's important that uh, states maintain uh, an open uh, dialogue with CSOs, that of course, as I mentioned, uh, they uphold their obligations under the, con the Convention on Rights of People with Disabilities to involve um, uh, people with disabilities in uh, the decision-making process, especially as it relates to, to them. Uh, and of course that they make available sufficient uh, resources for uh, uh, participation processes and that, they, that the civil servants are trained properly to run them. Uh, I would note in particular here the new Council of Europe uh, guidelines uh, that were issued in 2017 for meaningful participation in political decision-making, uh, which detail exactly how this uh, could be done and have some really good uh, standards on that. The final issue is safe space. Uh, so here we uh, do see that civil society organizations are sometimes physically attacked. The members are physically attacked. Uh, they are threatened. Uh, they are intimidated. Um, also, a uh, problem is that there is often a negative public discourse uh, about civil society organizations being branded as uh, enemies of the state or the nation or uh, uh, branded as uh, foreign agents and so on. So these are, these are of course, unacceptable uh, uh, situations that do occur uh, in the public discourse. Um, we also note that there is a concern, a feeling among civil society organizations in some states that they are under surveillance, that they are being monitored uh, uh, by the security services, um, and of course that can also have a chilling effect on, on the way they operate. Um, and finally, also the issue of mental health of, of uh, uh, civil society activists, you know, there's, of course, uh, it can be difficult, uh, for example, in the, in the hotspots, in, in the areas in, in Greece and Italy where, where migrants arrive. There are many NGO activists out there, and we, we mentioned an example in the report of, of, of what that does to, to a person to work continuously in that kind of an environment uh, with refugees and how difficult it can be uh, for the activists as well, um, to, and, and, it's, and how important it is to give them psychological support. Um, of course, in this case, we would call on governments in general in this area of safe space to provide public statements supporting civil society organizations, and of course, where incidents occur, where there are attacks or threats, uh, that they should be effectively uh, investigated. Um, we, re we really emphasize in the report that it's important to refrain from some stigmatization. Um, uh, again, so, so this, it, it's important for both the government and uh, not to do that, and for the government to speak out against people who who do it to condemn uh, 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 not only uh, crimes, but also this sort of uh, negative discourse about uh, NGOs being, being foreign agents or, or, or you know, uh, having a negative influence on society and so on. The government really does need to speak out on that and, and counter that narrative. And, uh, and also, finally, I, I think the issue of, of, of hate crimes, so in some cases, of course, a an attack on a civil society organization, such as a civil society organization working on, on racism, for example, uh, can also be classified as, as a hate crime, as a, a crime committed with a bias motive. And so here we think it's important that there's enough data collected and published on that, and obviously that those, those hate crimes are uh, prosecuted to the, to the fullest extent of the law. Um, that was basically my, my sort of overall framing of the issue. Um, I'm happy to uh, take any questions maybe later after the speeches by the other participants are, are done. Thank you very much.